Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew himself what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a good deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to all who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized they were to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, but, and immediately the boat reached the land toward where they were going. So today in our reading we heard two separate stories of Jesus, both of which involve miracles, miraculous and wondrous signs that seem impossible for a normal human to do, but which Jesus seems to do with ease. Both occur on the same day and happen in a point of Jesus' ministry where he's really starting to become known as a teacher and a healer. So we have these two stories. And you know, the feeding of the 5,000, which is the first miracle in the story, this is the one miracle apart from the resurrection that actually appears in all four Gospels. So obviously it's something that the writers think is very important to take note of. So what happens in this story? Well, it starts off by Jesus crossing to the far side of Lake Galilee. And there's a crowd following Jesus. And they're attracted to him because of the signs he's doing for the sick. And it's interesting here that a little bit earlier on in the Gospel, Jesus actually scorns the attitude of people who would not believe unless they saw signs. But I think this crowd is a good example of the desire of human need to be well and the desire to follow something new and something wonderful and something miraculous, something that's different. So the desire for this overrides the words of Jesus and the crowd follows in large numbers. And I don't think they follow because they have faith in Jesus at this point. But they hope to get something out of Jesus. And you know, if you also read this passage, there's no actual teaching done by Jesus in this, in this story. Which, to me as well, says why did each gospel writer put it in if there's no actual teaching done by Jesus? But the focus here is on the wondrous power of Christ. So, to continue with our story, Jesus goes and proceeds up a mountain. Which to me brings up the story of Moses going up Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. So Jesus is sitting on the mountain with his disciples and we're told it's the Passover, the time of year for the Jewish people where they remember the deliverance from Egypt. The time when the breaking of bread is very, very important. In fact, it coincided with the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which marked the barley harvest and commemorated the escape from Egypt where 
There was so much urgency to escape that the bread didn't have time to rise. So we have a wonderful setting for this story and miracle that's about to occur, which is incredibly symbolic. It would have been incredibly symbolic for any Jewish readers of this story. Jesus is up a mountain at the most holy time of the year for the Jewish people, about to do a miracle with the provision of bread. So Jesus is sitting on the mountain and the crowd comes towards him. So he turns to Philip and asks him, where are we going to buy bread for all the crowd to eat? Now, being Jesus, this question is more a test than just the words of the question. It is a test of Philip to see how much he actually understands about Jesus and about what being a disciple is all about. So he answers practically. Of course, we don't have enough food. Now, feeding this many people would take more than six months' wages to actually give everybody something to eat. I think it's about right. I mean, you know, if you think you know, feed people for ten dollars a head, if you're lucky, you know, fifty thousand dollars. Well, I wish that was my six months' wages. That would be good. <laughs> so there's not enough money to buy food, and. I think that's the point of the question that Jesus is asking. Jesus knows there's no need to actually buy anything. And Philip's reply about money continues to reveal that lack of understanding. Philip is thinking only about the prohibitive cost and failing to see that Jesus himself is the source of food and life. And Philip's fellow disciple, Andrew, doesn't really do much better. Now, this is 20 questions with Jesus and we're two for nothing. He says, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Again, he misses the point. He only sees that there's a limited amount of food and he can't see beyond that to what Jesus might be able to do with it. Now, I would love to have seen the reactions of Philip and Andrew when they see what happens next in our story. Jesus asks the people to be sat down and then takes the loaves and the fishes and goes about distributing them to everyone until they were satisfied. That's a bit of a kick in the pants for Philip and Andrew, I think. Not only had they said that feeding the crowd would cost a little bit too much, but there was too little food anyway. And now they have to watch Jesus giving out enough food until everybody was satisfied. Not just they'd had something to eat, but they'd had enough to eat to fill them up. And then they are part of the disciples that when Jesus asks them to gather up the fragments, there are 12 baskets left over. Not a great day at disciple school, one would say. Plus, there are some writers as well who suggest that the actual 5,000 refers only to the men in the crowd as well. So there might have been even more than 5,000 people there. So what's the outcome of this? Now we have a crowd who've sat down and been fed. I mean, there's a partial recognition of who Jesus is. As they view what's happening, the crowd say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. They sort of get it. You know, viewing Jesus a bit like an Old Testament prophet, maybe again looking back on a Moses-like figure. What is clear, however, is that what the crowd think about Jesus and what the role of Christ should be is different to what Jesus thinks. For Jesus soon realises that the crowd want to come and take him by force and make him king. And the fact that Jesus then goes away all by himself, not even the disciples come with him, says to me that I think he's a bit annoyed that the people around him don't get it and don't get who he is. He needs to get away from them for a while to cool down and to reflect on what he's doing with these people.